Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started to be mindful of everybody's time. But the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library, Main Library, welcome Suzanne Gladney. Um, she is an immigration attorney and advocate for justice. She's the founder and director of the Migrant Farm Workers Assistance Fund, serving migrant and seasonal farm workers picking Missouri's fruit and vegetable crops. She specializes in immigration law and farm worker law issues. She was the managing attorney at Legal Aid of Western Missouri for 37 years. She advises community agencies serving immigrants, is a frequent speaker on immigration and migrant farm worker issues, and is active in a number of community, cultural, and social justice organizations. Suzanne, the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library welcomes you. Um, we are asking that if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. We will get them get to them at the end of Suzanne's presentation. And just as a note, this presentation is about farm workers and Suzanne is not able to give out personal immigration advice in a public presentation such as this. So Suzanne, I will start screen sharing and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. I am very happy to be here. And we will, we're going to start uh, with a short video that was made a couple of years ago as a part of a project that we, Migrant Farm Workers Assistance Fund, are involved with. Uh, we are the co-lead with the University of Kansas School of Social Welfare. This is a project to hear the voices of migrant farm workers and their families. And this is the first video uh, that we made. You'll hear several voices of migrant farm workers themselves. And you'll see that the territory uh, in Lafayette County, Missouri, which is a county that just uh, is immediately connected to Jackson County on the east side. So um, I think we'll start this video and then we'll talk a little bit more about the farm work. I was coming and going and coming and going. I came here, but before I went to Carolina, to Florida, to California. We came from the other places, and here is where we work, picking fruit. Sometimes this three months is the longest they are anywhere during the year. go here and call here if they're hiring. If they're hiring, we can all go as a family. Like we all stay together. In Mexico, you do many jobs. Mason, field hand, the jobs were harder and they paid less. Mi sobrina iba a nacer. I came because my niece was going to be born. My brother was here. He was working on the roads and trimming trees. I was 13 and I was here with my mom. My sister and my brother-in-law, like, they were good and they were stabilized and everything. It was hard for my mom to have us but not her. I was almost eight months pregnant and I was scared because I have just moved and about to deliver my baby. It's difficult when you come over, when you don't know people and when you don't have anything, because I have gone through a time when I didn't have anything. Most of them don't know English, so that is a big uh, you know, barrier for them to be able to communicate with people uh, because they don't know the language. They stay in small groups. Nobody knows they're there, except the growers, you know, the people that hire them. I believe most providers are, they're ignorant to how it really is for the migrant farm workers. But once you learn about what they're going through, you, you tend to make adjustments. We have a worker or a worker and family in the fall for the apple and peach season. Usually at that point, they go either to Florida or Texas to get themselves established 
where they're going to be for citrus. They may go back to Mexico in the very cold weather or around Christmas. Especially if they have kids in school, they probably won't stay for very long in Mexico, maybe two or three weeks, and then come back, and then start a northward progression, usually to Georgia to do onions. Some of them will split into different locations, and those folks, those workers and families, will probably be in three to four different locations in the United States. It's a circuit of several different locations, and so it's not that they know exactly where they're going to go. Well, I think family means everything. And even through like difficult times, we like we stay close. Like that's just who we are. We we're like a close family and it's hard for us to be away. <laughs> We do a lot of different jobs, mainly rural work. In the fields, all the time I was in the fields. From working in Florida, I came here. Someone invited me. In Florida, all those sacks were full, heavy, and I was all scratched up. The trees had thorns, so I came here. Trees here don't have thorns, so I can pick more and get hurt less, less scratches, and make more money. I liked it, and I continued year after year, and I met the other workers and my bosses, and I stayed, and here I am. Me and my two sisters, we work in the line. We work Monday through Friday is from 6 in the morning to 5.30. And on Saturdays is from 6 in the morning to like 3 in the afternoon. My two brother-in-laws, they drive a tractor at the field. And my husband, he's in the field walking. I have been driving a truck for 10 years. To drive, it means to carry boxes full of fruit, take out empty boxes to workers as needed, and bring them in for packaging. Food. But before I started driving the truck, I used to work at the orchard to maintain the orchard, pruning whatever they needed. I would help them to pick peach, and then after the peaches there were apples, whatever required picking, and then the harvest. And then there was driving the tractor, and then the truck, and when I finished with the truck, it was all over, and we would start again. Their family, for generations, have been farm workers. Most of them in Mexico, that's what their great-great-grandparents did. They've all done outside farm work. I mean, they're working when it's really hot. They're working in October when it's starting to get cool, um, down to 40 degrees in the daytime. Heat is definitely a factor. They're looking up into trees, into the sky, into the sun, wearing a long sleeve shirt because they're right up in the middle of them. Building trust with migratory people and people who are in very rural settings is important because often they don't know where they are and they don't know how they're going to get somewhere. They don't know who's going to help them. So you want them to trust you. But you have to get it going pretty fast. We try to be there on the day that we know the crew's coming. We're hosting some sort of gathering space for people to come and learn about the resources that are available to them. Inherently, there's a power dynamic between us as social service providers and people who are here in need of services. And so I think anything that we can do to kind of level the playing field a little bit more helps us build connections and helps them feel a lot of trust for us. In the work that we do, we'll sometimes bring providers from some of the local clinics with us when we go out to the labor camps and meet people. And I think that helps with kind of initiating that process of building trust and building the awareness of how one can access healthcare. 
Um, so if you're there with food and with things to welcome them, I mean, they're, they're usually very happy to, to see people. You see that, like, starts to become a bond. And then, like, seeing you guys year after year, it's, like, not, like, just a person you normally see. It's more like, oh, look, that's Susan. Or, oh, look, that's Kaylee. And I think as soon as you open that window, you interact with them. Even that hola. You know, they're like, well, she speaks my language. She's someone I can talk to. She's someone I can communicate with. It's always, I think, that reassurance to them to know that they have someone that they can speak to. Live well, buenas tardes. Interpreting a clinic environment, it definitely goes both ways. They have questions for the provider. The provider has questions for them. And so, you know, just getting that information across to both parties is definitely very important. Having Yesenia there, the patient then becomes much more accepting. And that's why Yesenia is so crucial, because she's part of their population, they trust her. It, it goes a long way, so, and it builds that trust. It's the link that's so important uh, for me to the patient. Sometimes they come to us, but a lot of times we go to the packing sheds. We'll ask to see if anybody needs uh, daycare for their children. We try to provide not just the basic needs, but also we try to help the families to better themselves. To, to do stuff, you know, that's gonna help them get a better life. I don't see that in other places, and I do think it's like really, really helpful. Well, for pickers, I think the biggest danger is falling. If the basket's half full or more, they, they could have, you know, 60 to 80 pounds, and they're up and down, up and down, up and down. I think for the packing shed, you're standing in the same position for a very long time and you're doing the same repetitive motions with your hands, with your wrists, with your elbow. Pretty common issue that we run into is an eye issue called pterygium. Your muscle starts to harden and so that requires eye surgery. I myself am a Lion Club member. So I went through the Lions Club and asked for them to for a donation for this gentleman, and they picked up the bill for him to go in and, and have his eyes corrected. Either weekends or extended hours are crucial uh, to the population because getting off of work isn't like what most of us are accustomed to. And then when they get in, they, I can't do the typical dental appointment, which we call a limit exam or emergency exam, where I'll go in, I'll tell them what's wrong, and then usually it's, we'll get you in next week. Getting off of work is, very difficult for them. They're not allowed to leave and sometimes the hours that they work they can't give them up. So having that time when it's after work which would basically be that 6 to 6.30 range uh, is it's really important to them and especially with the migrant population once I learned what they go through um, you, your ability to become empathetic and get more compassionate to their cause and then you find yourself really wanting to help even more. So I always try to look at it through that lens, like what if I were this person? And knowing what I know now, it really changes your decisions. And I know they appreciate it. If I go to the doctor, I have to tell the boss. I have to tell the person in charge a day ahead and the time. It's a bit difficult because production is every day the same. So the only thing I ask them is to make the appointment late so they can be with me at work and then go see the doctor. Everything about their lives is uncertain. So healthcare is a huge one. If you have a physical health issue, a chronic disease, if you're doing something that needs any sort of consistency or repeat visits, we see people with chronic diseases that arrive who have been three to four to five months without the medication for it. They know what they have, they know what they need, but they haven't been any place where they could, they could access it. And so those things that need consistent follow-up are really, really hard for people that are constantly on the move. Here, the people helped me because you helped me 
and they treated me well to look for a doctor and to go to many appointments. They scheduled the appointments with a doctor that does not charge a lot of money. Because if you go somewhere else, you will be paying more. But with this program, they charge you less for medication and for appointments, for the dentist, the eye doctor, and the family clinic. For me, it is a good help what your program has given us. Medical care for your health has helped us a lot. And of course, childcare. I think it is a good and safe place. Your project had helped me with the school. Your staff helped me to enroll my kids, also to translate, because I don't know English. I think that the most important thing for people who move and have kids is childcare, because in order to be able to work, you need care for your kids. It's difficult when you come over, when you don't know people and when you don't have anything. We came over here because my husband knows people and he knows your program. And we know people that will help us if we need it. We know that this program will help us. I feel good. I feel happy because of your support. Because when I come here, I go see you and I am thankful. I rely on your help. I trust you. And I know I have your help. Thank you very much for showing the video. I would ask that no one mute Suzanne or myself <laughs> so that we can maintain sound. Thank you. So to get started, um, I want to thank the library system. I came to see the visit, the uh, exhibit that they have here at the uh, Minnesota Main Library branch in Kansas City, Kansas. And the, the exhibit is really, really interesting. Um, there are, I'm not sure exactly how many photos, but um, probably 50 or more um, very large photos that, that feature the farm workers. And the, the text um, next to them, to each photo, has the voices of, of the farm workers, um, has the, what they have to say about their work. The farm workers in the photos are in uh, the Central Valley in California and lots of different crops, olives, dates, um, avocados, lots and lots of different, different crops and different people. It's a very, very interesting exhibit and it goes uh, through mid-December. I was invited to speak a little bit about the program that we have, Migrant Farm Workers. Uh, which is in Lafayette County, Missouri. And um, I have some a few slides and a few photos about the farm workers that we work with. Their lives and their situations are very, very different from what, uh, what we have seen in the photos here in the photo exhibit um, in, in the library system. I think Probably the majority of the difference, the major difference is because the farms, the orchards where, the or, where these families live in Lafayette County are very small, privately owned 
family owned and the family members are still there and have most of them have grown up with working with workers and families and they are they are living on the property of of the orchard <clears throat> these are very very small operations compared to what ours are you see in the in the exhibit here a very different kind of farm work <clears throat> So as we go through some of these photos, you'll see um, some of the, the families and farm workers that we have in Lafayette County. The history of migrants in Lafayette County goes back before our organization, which started in 1984. Um, there are several families who came here initially as migrant workers and have been over time given full-time jobs on the orchard property. They still, many of them still live there and are still working there, but uh, most of them uh, that are, are that long ago um, came in the late 1970s. We're a nonprofit uh, organization. We do a whole range of services, uh, providing emergency assistance. You'll see some of that uh, medical, dental case management, education and legal assistance, um, leadership development with, um, with the, the kids as well as the adults and community building. <clears throat> Lafayette County is immediately east of Jackson County. Our office is in Midtown Kansas City and uh, the closest orchard is 58 miles away. Uh, the farthest uh, for us is about uh, 90 miles away. So the Highway 24 in Kansas City is Independence Avenue. If you go straight out Independence Avenue, uh, you will end up in Lafayette County, or if you go on I-70 um, and get off at the Odessa or Concordia exit, you'll, you'll see these same, um, these same roads. The orchard spread over that 50 mile, 50, 60 mile span all the way from Napoleon and Wellington to east of Waverly along Highway 24. The orchards that we are um, have people working in are primarily peaches, which start uh, in the late part of June, and then apples. And mo the workers who come for peaches, there's about 50 to 60 of them that come for the peach crop, it, crop and then they stay on for apples. Some of the workers that we serve are, of course, here year round, and others are migratory. Uh, the migratory groups generally are people that when they leave here and they're, they have just now left uh, the migrants, we have about 20 that are still here uh, to finish out uh, some of the work. But um, the, the migrants that we serve, um, the large group of them have just left, will go to Texas and to Florida, generally for citrus in those locations. Sometimes they will leave for a short time to go back to Mexico and then come back again. The year round families, we have about 67 families this year that are staying. Um, that's about 360, 370 people, uh, most of them with children. The migrants uh, who were here this year were a few more than 200 uh, households. Um, it varies depending on uh, how abundant the crop is. So we had had a pretty good apple season this year. Of the migrants, many of them are single men. Um, they, they have, most of them have families. They have wives and children um, still in Mexico and they come as what are called temporary visas uh, for farm worker visas or H2A is, is the, the, uh, the, the government name of what that program is. <clears throat> these folks are working when they're here in apples and peaches. There are some other crops in the area that occasionally will need an extra hand or two, and they may call an orchard and say something like, do you have three or four guys that could come over and help me do asparagus this week or do um, hay baling this week? And sometimes that will, that will be a little extra money for them. Of the migrants that we have and see in Lafayette County, the majority of them are either born in Mexico or born of Mexican parents. 
Uh, we did, we do have some from Central America. The majority of those are from Guatemala, a few from Honduras. And we have, right now we have one Jamaican family. In some years we've had as many as 15 or 16 Jamaicans here. Um, the, the people that we're serving have a variety of immigration statuses, all within blended families. Um, some people, most of the children that we have are born here in the United States. So automatically they are US citizens. They may have a dual citizenship with another country, but they are born here. So they are US citizens by birth. We also have families that um, are in the process of gaining immigration status. Um, mainly through someone in the family who is either a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. Only about 20% or maybe even a little less of the adults are bilingual. Um, they may speak some English in order to, to speak with a supervisor. Uh, most, most of them uh, are Spanish speakers. We, we occasionally will have a group of folks that uh, speak an indigenous language from Mexico but we haven't had that for a couple of years now. Um, most of the adults uh, who have been here for a while um, have a rural education in Mexico uh, where it is primarily an er elementary education that's available in the, in the rural areas there. If you want your child to go beyond that, you need to pay for them in town. Uh, to in a larger town close by to go to high school and stay with someone during the week. And most of the most of the adults that we have uh, that we serve uh, do not have that background. Most of them have an elementary um, background. Women often have a fifth or sixth grade uh, reading level. Uh, men maybe second or third grade. The average income varies pretty widely from depending what the job is that you're doing. In the video, you saw pickers. Uh, pickers are doing more dangerous work and are out there from really the first ray of sun in the morning till um, the evening when it's, it's already starting to get dark. And they, they are earning more than the people in the packing shed. Those packing sheds, each one of the or three orchards has a packing shed. And those packing sheds, uh, typically it's, it's almost, it's like an apple or a peach factory. Lots and lots of conveyor belts, uh, people standing and doing uh, polishing of apples, sorting of apples, um, washing apples, making a fast decision. Is this apple, apple sauce? Is it apple juice? Is it apple that's gonna be in a bag in the grocery store? Um, and those folks are paid by the hour. The, um, <laughs> That family is a family that um, had a very, they were here for, for several years, for about 10 years, and then decided that um, they really wanted to see their families and needed to go back to Mexico. We hear from them pretty often. Uh, they, have, they have four children and um, they would like to come back, but at this point uh, don't, don't have any method to be able to get back. We have a lot of families. Um, the, it is school culture shock for children who have not been in school in the United States before. Um, we, we do a lot of work with education for children. Um, the kids that we work with spread over three different school districts, um, Wellington, Lexington, and the Santa Fe district on the east side. Um, so we're very involved with education and, and school issues. Yesenia, who you saw in the video um, in the LiveWell clinic, um, and Dr. Peterson, the dentist, uh, was talking about how helpful she is in the clinic. This is her in, this is Yesenia in her graduation from Donnelly College, um, right here in Kansas City, Kansas. We have had five five students graduate from Donnelly College. Donnelly, this is her entire family, her mom, her dad, uh, and, and her siblings. Um, Yesenia is, is still working in a clinic system and is now a community health worker, as well as an interpreter. And 
we we work really hard to get students in in college. Donnelly has been a really good place for our students. When you're coming from these very very small rural schools, uh, where your graduating class might be six to twelve students, it's really hard to go into a huge university system. And Donnelly is a really good uh, a really good place for them to start. Health care issues are a big part of what we are in what we are involved with. Um, as it was said in the video, um, many of migrant workers know what their health care needs are, but they are moving around so much to three to four to five places every year. For many of them, the time that they're here in Lafayette County is the longest time they're in one place in the United States. And since we are providing healthcare case management, uh, we often see people who arrive and they have been three, four or five months without the medication that they know they need, whether that's insulin, whether that's high blood pressure medication. Um, and so we are, we are very active in, in getting healthcare uh, case management. The clinic system that we work with now, uh, the Live Well system, where Dr. Peterson, the dentist, uh, is the is the dental supervisor. That system is is part of a, a very big partner of ours, and they do give us evening appointments um, during the migrant season, and they give us a Saturday clinic during the migrant season, where we are able to do a lot of appointments. Our typical year uh, of appointments is, a, is between 450 and 500 appointments a year, where we are accompanying the appointments, we're uh, to the appointment. Um, we are often providing transportation or helping them get transportation. Um, we are helping with some of the cost. We're picking up medications, delivering medications. Other direct services that we provide, and you'll see in, in some of the photos coming up, food distribution. Um, I know there are probably many people listening who have grown up in rural areas. Uh, the 60 mile span um, of Lafayette County has one grocery store. We do food distribution. We are a harvesters uh, network partner and actually tomorrow morning is our harvesters delivery. We will have between five and six tons of food arriving tomorrow. That's our typical monthly delivery of food from harvesters. We also pick up food at harvesters. We go there and pick up more food. We also um, do clothing distribution, blankets, uh, coats. Um, when migrants are here in the migrant season, uh, generally they're arriving in the last week of July, first week of August, and they're leaving end of October, beginning of November. So they are arriving in the hot, hot, hot part of Missouri heat, um, and they're very limited in what they're allowed to bring with them. Generally, the, the recruiter that has recruited them brings them in school buses, or the crew leader puts them in vans. And so they're very limited in what they're allowed to bring. So they're, they're bringing with them summer clothes. Um, and then when they're still here in late September and October, uh, we are providing a lot of clothing with longer sleeves, uh, sweaters, sweatshirts, coats, uh, blankets. We do a lot with school and education. We help with the enrollment of kids. We're very fortunate that this group of migrants arrive right before school starts. So we're able to get kids the enrollment forms, get parents uh, signed up with the enrollment forms, get records from prior schools if that's needed, uh, get vaccinations. As, as you know, um, many states have different vaccination rules or what, what age you need to have a different vaccination. And so we can get those done before school starts. College visits. Um, we do college visits with students. We talk to students a lot about college. Most of their parents don't have any awareness of exactly what college is or how you would help your child access that. 
So even for the migratory students who sometimes we see them one year and we never see them again, we do a lot of discussion about college and um, give them our information so that they can contact us no matter where they are to try to help get, get them on the way uh, to being able to get some additional education. We've talked about medical and dental case management that we do, specialty medical care if the primary care clinic um, refers them for something more, more serious uh, surgery or cancer or some other serious issue that they have going on. Immigration assistance. I'm an immigration lawyer. I provide immigration assistance, public benefits assistance, um, Medicaid. Um, as many of you know, Medicaid is different state to state. Um, you can't access Texas Medicaid usually if you're in Missouri unless the, the doctor here has, has permission to bill Texas Medicaid, which usually is not the case. Uh, we also are very involved with education from very young to, ver to college um, and even beyond college with uh, ESL classes and GED assistance. Parents as teachers, we're just now starting this year. Um, as many of you know, Parents as Teachers is a home uh, program where parents are the first teachers of their children and the Parents as Teachers advocates and educators um, in Lafayette County are not Spanish speakers. So we accompany them and interpret for the parents as teachers session, uh, sitting on the floor with the mom and the kid um, and interpreting, uh, looking for those uh, developmental met um, metrics. We also um, were fortunate to be able to get set up in Missouri, a migrant Head Start program. Um, these small towns and small communities have a Head Start program, but generally the people who are here all year are filled and have waiting lists for the, for the year round program. We were able to get a migrant Head Start program started about 17 years ago, and it's really great. The teachers are also migratory. They arrive in the third week of July, and they left um, in the last week of October. Uh, to go on to be a migrant uh, teacher uh, in a Head Start program in another location. Youth and summer programs. Um, most of the schools do not have a summer program in these rural schools, uh, summer school. They will often have summer school if you need credit recovery, if you're a senior, uh, but for, uh, for elementary and middle school and other high schoolers, no. So we do a lot in the summer going around with activities and programs to try to help uh, keep help kids uh, continue to think and not just uh, be sitting in their in their units alone. Um, ESL and GED, we help as much as possible to get people in touch with those programs. Uh, the reality for the migrants is that generally those programs are are not very available to them because they're working such long, such long days. Many of the migrants uh, are working six to seven days a week and going to a class is, is not, not really very possible for them. We have had some GED success um, in the off season with people who live here year round, uh, getting them into a local GED program with us interpreting for them. We have some community building activities, a women's group that starts uh, generally in January, um, January or February and goes through the spring. We're hoping, of course, last couple of years with COVID, uh, we, the women's group um, hasn't been able to, to be as active as they have been, but we're hoping that this coming spring, we will be able to have women's group in person. Community events we have every year, um, we have a graduation dinner to honor the graduates and their parents uh, from high school and from college. And we also have an annual um, holiday Christmas uh, dinner and gifts for the children. This year, uh, as with last year, um, we will be handing out gifts and we will be handing out boxed dinners instead of having people sitting together. So we're gonna go through some pictures here of Monday night services. Monday nights during the apple season, um, we have a big parking lot um, activity 
um, that um, starts on the first Monday in August and goes to the last Monday in October. So every Monday, we have a big, huge parking lot uh, outside of the Migrant Head Start building where we have lots of tables and people can come, they can get food bags, they can get, they can look at clothing tables, they can get books for kids, they can get coats and blankets, diapers, hygiene kits, um, all kinds of things, backpacks when we're starting school. Uh, we talk to them about medical needs. Uh, often we have nurses in the parking lot doing during screenings for high blood pressure. They were doing COVID tests and COVID, vaccine, uh, COVID vaccines, as well as COVID tests this year, um, provide other, other information that they need. What we see on Monday nights during the season as people start arriving is that they will, it's very communal with people just walking around. Um, there's a lot of pictures coming up here of, of the Monday nights. Um, they are, they're just walking around, they're looking at tables and they will see someone that they worked with at another camp that they were living in another camp and they didn't know that person is here this year. Um, somebody that they worked with two or three years ago, someone that they worked with last year, someone that's from their hometown and they didn't know was here. Um, so it's a very communal event on these Monday nights. Kids getting backpacks there, uh, kids finding toys, kids finding books, um, me talking to the Jamaicans there from last year. Lots of smiling faces, lots of people finding clothes, t-shirts, um, things that, socks, things that they can use um, and working on filling out applications. Um, me, many people who are permanent residents need to renew their card every 10 years and a lot of them know they can do it here. People that are constantly on the move have trouble getting things done because they don't have a permanent address where, where the mail can be sent. So our post office box is something that, that we use on many of these applications. And then they will stay in touch with us, we'll stay in touch with them. And when we get their card or we get a notice, we can send it to wherever they are at that point, or they can say, oh, just hold on to it. I will be back here in a month and I'll pick it up from you then. Our youth group, um, we've had a youth group now for more than 20 years. Um, it, we used to call it the, the Migrant Youth Group and the kids decided that they wanted to have a different name. And so now it's called Tech, the Teen Empowerment Collective. We pick up kids um, after school from their three schools, their three school districts and bring them to a common place uh, where they can be together and do activities together. For most of, the, most of these three school districts, our kids are the minority and they, they are very, very small. Uh, it's a very small uh, number of them. And so we may have two eighth graders, but they may be in schools that are 50 miles apart. So getting these kids together um, where it's a place that they can be a kid, um, we have emphasis on college, on careers, on goal setting, on community service, um, and on, on doing activities together uh, in a rural setting where, where there aren't any other Latino or Latina groups. There's going to be some pictures here. Um, the Red Star Studio, which is in the Belger system, uh, Belger um, has an art studio and art museum. Um, and so we did a mask making uh, project with a Mexican, uh, Mexican artist who came to town. We also have taken them to um, the Latino Writers Club, the animal shelter. There's an animal shelter outside of Higginsville, Missouri, um, where the, it's totally volunteers. And so we have signed up in the past a couple of days during the during the year where the kids can go and, and volunteer. And um, the parents always say, be sure they don't bring home any of the animals. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they do enjoy being, uh, working and volunteering with the animals. <clears throat> They've also done service at Ronald McDonald House on one of their annual events, uh, collecting aluminum pop tabs. 
We also have taken them on bike riding. We've taken them to the Latino Writers Program. Uh, there's a lot of different places that we take the youth group as well as just the weekly sessions. This is Latino Writers, having them get up to a microphone, uh, taking them camping. Most of the kids have never been on a camping trip before. Um, so we've, we've taken them on camping trips. We did a ride on the Katy Trail together. Um, and they really, really enjoyed that, that ride on the Katy Trail and, and seeing that together. Um, this was a project of the Missouri Extension where they have a blender bike uh, that uh, you can make smoothies uh, with this using the, you don't have to plug it in, you can use the bicycle to run the blender. Uh, it was a very interesting program for the kids. We try to take them to colleges here in the area, Donnelly, as well as UMKC. UMKC is one of the pro one of the universities in the area that has a first generation program where students that start there have a specific advisor um, and a group a setting to, to work with as first generation students. So in our, in our little kid programs, uh, we come up with a lot of things to do with little kids. Uh, Reader's theater is one that they like. They like to act out things and then Kind of on the sly, you can get them to read because they have to read what their what their part is, and they they're having so much fun with the costumes or hats they've made or whatever they've made for the readers theater that they don't quite realize that they're being made to read. We have had some tutoring programs where we sit with students that are having some trouble. We just finished parent teacher conferences and in October, and often there are some students that need some extra help. So either getting them lined up with a tutor at school, if, the, if there's a teacher that's staying under or giving them some extra help as they may need it. The women's group meets on Friday mornings um, during the springtime. We pick up the women and we pick up their children uh, that are under, under five, not in school, um, to have topics, uh, to exercise, to be together um, for the morning. Again, we're picking up women over a 50, 60 mile range and getting them together in, in a, a Baptist church uh, fellowship hall that uh, they're very kind to let us do that. <clears throat> they did a, a fundraiser uh, for a family, actually a, a migrant family that the, the mother of the family died uh, one year when, when they left and went back to Texas. And the women's group did a fundraiser to organize, uh, to send some money for the funeral uh, by making tamales. Women's group outing, uh, getting them out, uh, walking. Um, this was a, a, the white t-shirts. Um, the health department had a program to get people walking and had some little pedometers where you could uh, take track of your, keep tracking of your steps. And uh, that was something that they were very interested in doing. So we, we did a lot of walking. <clears throat> Planting gardens, we take out a membership in Kansas City Community Gardens and um, usually take the women uh, there to pick out plants. Uh, the last two years with COVID, um, we, have, we have picked up the plants here and taken them uh, rather than having large numbers uh, in cars coming into Kansas City. Hopefully we'll be able to do that. We usually have a, a group potluck at the end. Um, at the end, this was a few years ago um, before COVID, of course. Our annual Christmas party is coming up. Uh, this year, it will be on December 8th, um, where we have pinatas and gifts for the kids. And you'll see some pictures of that floating through here. So the healthcare program uh, is coming up next after graduation. Graduation, um, this year we had seven graduates um, from high school. Uh, that's the most we've ever had in a year. Um, we hosted an, um, an event for them in June. <clears throat> this is Maria Ruiz uh, in the, she graduated from UCM in Warrensburg. Um, she is a surgical nurse at Truman Lakewood and lives in Lexington still. And these are some of her family members 
Um, and then Yesenia again from Donnelly, high school graduates. We have a dinner usually, graduation dinner. We encourage everyone in the community to come. Um, Alex, who is holding the microphone there, um, graduated this, this year um, from <clears throat> Maple Woods with an interpreting um, certification. Um, and she was hired in July uh, by the Live Well Clinic system to uh, be a community health worker and interpreter for their system. Medical case management, we've talked about a little bit already. Um, the programs that we work with are the Live Well system. The Live Well system has five small clinics across the county. Uh, we mainly are, are in the, um, the Lexington and the Waverly clinics, the, those two locations. They are small, very small clinics, um, but we're, we're extremely grateful for them. Vision Source Eye Care also is a partner of ours. Um, eye injuries and eye issues because of looking up at the sun are very important. Live Well Clinics, this is from this year uh, when we were doing um, outreach in the labor camps. This is a labor camp building uh, behind, behind where we're standing. We are doing COVID vaccines in that picture. Um, we did a lot of a lot of vaccines out in the labor camps this year. And we were very successful that we were able to get a lot of them vaccinated, um, a, lot, a, a lot of the workers vaccinated. We also took photographs um, of their cards. I don't, probably many people listening have a COVID vaccination card. Um, they are in a very difficult size, as you probably have noticed, and doesn't fit in your wallet very well. Um, and especially for people on the move, uh, we're, we were worried that it was likely to be lost or folded, um, damaged in some way. So we have copies of those and have told them um, that we would be able to get another, another card um, if they were to lose it. And in the meantime, if they needed it, we could send them a copy of it. So this is us doing that. This is the Live Well Clinic um, checking in for a medical appointment or and someone um, having a dental appointment in the evening. The photo on the right is doing blood pressure checks uh, in the parking lot of uh, one of our Monday nights um, and doing flu, flu shots uh, on the left. The Latina Summer Academy is a summer proje project that we have uh, been a part of for the last 15 years. Um, it's in Omaha, Nebraska at the College of St. Mary. And this has been a really good program for um, girls that are juniors and seniors uh, living in a, in a college dorm for a week and having a program just with, with Latinas. You'll see some other pictures of, of them and how, um, how they've met um, other Latinas from across the country that, and really made some friendships. Other summer activities, we're gonna zip through these. These are summer activities with young kids uh, where we are taking them for uh, out to the park um, to do some outdoor game days or to make slime or to make ice cream, um, art projects, fishing trips. Um, you, you'll see some photos of those, these summer activities that we're doing with kids. These kids live in very isolated places. Um, Waverly doesn't have any paved roads except the highway that goes right through. The population is about 400 people. Um, it has a Casey's gas station, an auto parts store, um, a very small little bakery, and it just in the last year has a general dollar general. So it, that's really a lot of these kids live in Waverly. So taking them out for activities. The challenges are probably pretty, uh, pretty um, obvious here, uh, but we, we have a lot of partners. Um, the distances are vast. 
Um, a lot of people don't have reliable cars or they may not have the legal status to be able to get a driver's license. And so they're very leery of driving. They're very worried of driving. Um, their low income uh, leads them to um, need to have food help uh, and other, other help from us, um, other assistance. Um, lack of housing or poor housing. The, the, the labor camp housing that you see in the exhibit here in the library um, is much, much, much worse than what you see in Lafayette County. There are, there are buildings, there are dorm buildings. Um, most of them do not have separate bathrooms for each unit. Uh, they may have a shared bathroom but there is a bathroom that connects to the building. It's not where you have to go outside and, and down a road to another, another space. Um, their lack of, lack of other programs. Many of the workers tell us that the places that they go, there aren't programs like this that can help them with, with these various needs that they have. The digital divide, I think um, really has become awareness in the pandemic. Um, towns that don't have Wi-Fi, very few cell towers out there. Um, computer access is very, very difficult out there. Um, the Santa Fe School District, um, when the pandemic started, they thought that they were going to be able to use Google Classroom. But in fact, there wasn't enough bandwidth out there to be able to do that. So they ended up just having buses come around with packages of paper packages to the houses, not for migrants, but for everybody. Language divide, uh, there are very, very few Spanish speakers in any of, the, any of the service locations, whether it's schools, whether it's the clinics, whether it's any sort of uh, government office. There, there's, there's usually not a Spanish speaker there. Lack of role models um, in, in the town or in other organizations. Um, for our youth groups, we try to have Latinos from Kansas City and from Marshall come and talk to the groups about what they do in their job, um, what, what kind of background education they needed in order to do their job, uh, to give the teens a better idea of what they might do after school. So needs, uh, the needs are, are vast for people uh, that we're working with. Mental health counseling in Spanish is, is a huge need. Um, we, we will do it, we will interpret for it, but interpreting uh, in a mental health setting it really, really is helpful if the person can speak directly to the therapist or counselor, um, which, which is very, very limited out there. ESL classes and more GED access um, is very, very important for people. Um, access to computers and literacy classes, internet. Many of you may know that the GED program now, if this isn't new, it's several years ago, it's gone to a completely online system. Uh, the test is, is all on computer. So if you are not a computer literate person, you're gonna have very difficult time even, even taking the GED test. So uh, access to computers, adult classes in Spanish uh, on various topics. We've had um, Holy Rosary Credit Union come out and talk about budgeting, about financial information, uh, we've had the community garden people talk to us about horticulture and gardens. Um, so parenting with parents as teachers, help for adults that might want to transition out of agriculture. Um, that's a really hard transition for people to make uh, when this is what their, their families have done for, G for, for decades, for generations. College access. Um, people to come and talk to them about college and people to help us give tours um, and to meet students and talk to them when they're coming. So this talks about our partners uh, and we're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, so I think that 
Magda is going to ask about questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. These are some of our many, many partners that work with us. Um, we, have, we have strong support out in, in Lafayette County. Uh, we offer to interpret for any person, uh, any organization that has a Spanish speaker that comes in that needs, needs our help. They can call us and we can interpret over the phone. So. So I don't see any questions in the chat room. If anyone, anyone has any questions, would you, would you please type it in really fast? While we're waiting for that, I want to thank the library system for bringing the exhibit um, and for collecting donations. Uh, there's a lot of donations here right now, and I'm sure more will be coming in. Uh, this is a time of year that we're giving out blankets um, and I see a stack of blankets over here. I also want to say that your library system, I'm sure many of you listening um, already know this, but the library system has information about fiction as well as nonfiction about farm workers and migrant farm workers in particular, um, and how you might even learn more about what they're doing. Um, if there are people who are interested in volunteering with us, our biggest need for volunteers is in, in the fall, um, starting in August, uh, when we have the Monday nights, we can use uh, people to come, we can use the help of people coming out and helping us on Monday nights uh, with our distributions there in the parking lot. That's an important part of what we do. It also gives you a, a firsthand look to meet with people. Even if you're not a Spanish speaker, don't feel like that means you can't come. Um, many, many, many of the workers um, are, can speak some English um, and helping somebody find a t-shirt or a blanket, um, really you don't need a whole lot of English to be able to do that. So I don't know if you saw um, Pat's comment. This program caught my attention because in the early 60s, I volunteered at a school in Walcott to babysit the children of WICO migrant workers working in Western WICO. The families lived in old abandoned buses while they were here. That's, uh, when you look at the pictures, uh, the photos here in the exhibit here, you'll see some really, really bad uh, situations um, of housing. Uh, well, it's not even really true to call it housing, but um, in the Boot Heel of Missouri, which is where where we started with this program in 1984, um, there were people living in chicken houses, in barns, in their cars, in buses, um, in abandoned school buses, uh, because there's very, very, very little dormitory sort of housing like there is here or, or units like they have here. Um, so there are, there are places that are much, much different than Lafayette County. So um, Carol asked, are there any farmers to assist them with decent housing? And are there some who can assist with transportation to the farms? Um, and the question is, are there, is that something volunteers could do? Um, we, we generally don't have volunteers helping us with transportation, primarily because we're not sure that their car would have the liability insurance coverage if, if there would be some sort of an accident. We do have four vehicles of our own um, that Migrant Farm Workers owns that we do transport people in those. Um, that we do take donations and we have lots of opportunities for volunteers. So if a, someone is interested in volunteering with us, that would be great for, for people to call and talk to me or talk to Elizabeth about op opportunities for individual okay. Okay. volunteers. So do you care um, if everybody that attended tonight, I send them your contact info or your website? Oh, that's fine. Sure. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was telling some of the many agencies that support us. Okay. We are, as Suzanne said, we are collecting um, for the, there's four things that they um, need most right now. And we are collecting at the library and that is clean blankets or even new blankets, 
um, clean or new sweatshirts, new backpacks, and Spanish language dictionaries. And so I'm happy to say that we already have one car load for them to take with them tonight. And that makes me very happy. Um, but if you are interested in contributing something like that, now's a great time to clean out your closet or go through things that you don't need. And this is just a, another opportunity to, to help some people that, that really do need it. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Come and see the exhibit. Um, I was here on sat Saturday and there was hardly anyone in the library. Um, it's definitely, um, you can social distance really across the whole building. Um, and it, it really is a lovely, lovely um, exhibit. It's a really important exhibit. Yeah. I was telling Suzanne when she got here that I had invited my mother today who lives in Southeast Missouri. That's where I'm from. And she was asking me what the event was about. And when I told her, she said, oh, your great grandmother and great grandfather, they did that. They went to Michigan and picked cherries. They picked cotton in Missouri. And then they picked strawberries in Arkansas. And so I just thought that was interesting. I learned a little um, bit today about some family that I did not know. I think in the, in this part of the country, I think there probably are a number of people's histories where where their family may have done something like this uh, because there's so many small small operations that need someone just for a short period of time. And as you said, you got started in Southeast Missouri. Um, that's a big cotton was a big cotton growing area, um, and it's very rural, very poor. Uh, and so most everybody that I knew farmed and they would have large areas of farmland to take care of. And so it makes a little bit more sense to me now as an adult that that's what was happening. Yes, we I was I was mentioning that we had two families, two two couples this year that had a little bit more time on their um, farm work visa and they went down to do cotton for about a month um, after they finished the apple season here so they're they're just getting ready to go back to Mexico um, we, we were just talking to them they're just getting ready to leave and go to Mexico after doing some cotton work down it's south of Kennett Missouri yep exactly where I was from south of <laughs> Kennett yeah thank you very much for this opportunity thank um, you Thank if you. there are other questions you think of, just call the office or, or e email me. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.